Vermont House Human Services Committee on um, Thursday, April 2nd uh, for our committee meeting. And for the next two hours, we're going to be focusing on um, <clears throat> the COVID-19 um, response and updates, as well as issues in the short term immediately and in the short term um, from the Department of Disability, Aging and Independent Living. Um, and uh, Commissioner Hutt, we have you first on the uh, list. Yes, hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see everybody's face. Um, so what I prepared was a pretty global overview of everything that the department is doing. And um, I think if I walk through that, it might be helpful. And then, um, but st it stays pretty high level. So then if there are specific questions, I assume people will just ask those as they come up or at the end, um, however you'd like me to handle that. Um, I think that for you to go ahead um, right now, I've asked people to hold their questions until you finish, um, partly because I can't see everyone okay. to figure that out. Okay, so um, let me just start then. And uh, again, apologies if I miss big areas, feel free to, to cue me as we're going through or at the end. Um, so just to consider Dale globally as a department, um, we do have obviously a number of roles and responsibilities related to older Vermonters and Vermonters with disabilities. And we know that from a COVID-19 perspective, those two populations, older Vermonters and Vermonters with disabilities with underlying health conditions are the ones that are most at risk for um, negative outcomes should they contract the COVID-19 virus. Um, so uh, the, the agenda asked me specifically to speak to long-term care, um, but I would just say that long-term care for us is both facility-based and community-based. You know, all the work that we've done across the state of Vermont over the last 25 or 30 years has been to push our long-term care system into community. So I think it's just really important first that people realize that when I talk about long-term care, there is facility-based long-term care, but there's also long-term care that's happening across the state through many different partnerships with many different provider groups. So I just wanna be really clear that I toggle back and forth when I talk about that and I'll try to be specific, but I want you all to hold both in your minds because um, they are equally important, um, especially as we consider our main goal, which is to try to keep people um, stable in community to avoid the, either the need for hospital placement or the push for hospital placement, not only because we need to maintain that capacity at hospitals, but because we know that hospitals for some of our, our more vulnerable Vermonters aren't necessarily going to be the easiest place to get their needs met, um, for them to understand what's happening, or for providers there to, to comprehend and support their really unique and complex needs. So there's a lot of reasons why this is so important, It's a, but it is really important. So just thinking about the, the big populations um, and the big kind of buckets that I look at, I look at our designated agencies and specialized service agencies who support um, a DS population, as you all know, but also who serve our choices for care population in terms of adult family care provision. Um, and of course, SLPs, that's shared living providers and developmental services. So that's a, a residential component of support that oftentimes um, people are not thinking about when they're thinking about long-term care. We also have TBI services that are provided through the designated agency and specialized service agency system. We have TBI standalone providers. We have our home health agencies who are supporting choices for care, high tech for adults through the Dale, through the Dale bucket or through the Dale column. Um, our area agencies on aging, so home delivered meals to older Vermonters, um, case management and choices for care, resource and referral, a lot of, lot of work on the senior health lines right now across the state of Vermont, um, and all of the Older Americans Act services. Um, and just as a uh, connected to that is the work that's happening through the Vermont Center for Independent Living and home delivered meals for Vermonters with disabilities. 
Um, that's a whole nother component. It tends to be a small component in normal times. In this time, it's, it's a burgeoning issue for, for all of us. Um, our adult day programs, although they are currently closed, um, we have got adult day providers that are still trying to support people um, across the uh, state and trying to figure out how to do that in people's homes, if at all possible. And so that's another component and service provider. Um, and then we have all of our long-term care residential providers that we think of more traditionally and typically. So our nursing homes, residential care homes, therapeutic community residences, assisted living. Um, there's a lot to what I perceive to be the scope of Dale. And, um, and it's a lot to hold and to, to pay attention to. So I wanted to make sure that, that you all had that as a committee. I know you know all those pieces distinctly, but as you're thinking about this particular response to know how they all sort of connect in. Um, so let me just keep moving through. So we've worked hard to establish regular communication venues and options for all of those different populations. Um, we're working and communicating with the designated agency executive directors on a weekly basis, with the DS directors within those designated and specialized services agencies on a regular weekly basis. I talk with the AAAs or somebody from my staff does three times a week, um, early morning times. Uh, we've had phone calls with um, the SILC, the Statewide Independent Living Council, um, and with home health fairly regularly. So trying to just stay connected to each of those provider groups on the ground in the, in the moment to hear immediate issues, to try to address them as quickly as possible and to, to be responsive and available. Um, I think that some of the biggest areas that we are seeing as a department, kind of the big buckets of concern um, it, it, it's really, you know, kind of workforce, workforce, workforce right now, which is not new, um, but has taken on a lot more urgency in the middle of all of this. So making sure that both our residential care facilities and our community-based providers can maintain their workforce. Because as we, as we said earlier, that's the workforce that knows this population and we can substitute in or if we could identify people, we could substitute in, but, but really those primary people that, that folks know, it's critical to keep them as available as possible. And that becomes challenging, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but for, for a variety of reasons throughout this, some, some expected and some unexpected. Um, also working really hard to try to support our provider community and to keep them stable as they have to cut back or, or deliver services in a different way. Um, and there's so much involved in that. There are the immediate needs. There's trying to understand what Congress is doing. And honestly, it's, it's kind of every day something new and different, multiple streams of support coming through Congress. So I don't want to be at all um, unhappy or ungrateful for that, but it is, it's confusing and there's a lot and trying to understand how it will impact the state has been really challenging. Um, so trying to assess that congressional package as much as possible and understand what it will do and won't do. Trying to figure out you know, the available state resources as, as the commissioner of DIVA points out, he started calling it green money. So it's that money that we know that we have available to us versus the federal government talking about kind of printing dollars if they need them, the state doesn't have that. And as we are reducing some of the um, requirements on providers across the whole system. So just as an example, you know, if we get to a place where we can ask providers or tell providers, hey, it's okay not to pay your provider tax right now, that reduces the revenues that we have available. So it's a whole kind of circle of trying to understand what's available at a state level. And then the Older Americans Act is a whole nother piece of um, legislation coming from the federal government that we keep trying to get clarity about to understand how it will help, where it will help, what we can do to leverage that. So that's another big bucket. A third big bucket is just reducing the barriers to service provision for our providers. So people are, um, 
providers are really stepping up and being as creative as they possibly can in terms of how they deliver services. Can we do it telephonically? Can we do it on a video chat? What does that mean? How is that meeting people's needs? How can we twist that around? Because we are really encouraging and, and there have been requirements to limit that face-to-face -face interaction, but it doesn't mean that interaction doesn't need to happen um, and that people aren't still relying on some level of interaction. And so figuring out how to eliminate any barriers that we may have created to all that creativity has been a huge body of work. Lots and lots of conversations over the last several weeks about essential versus non-essential services. And honestly, it continues to be a little bit of a moving target as this gets worse and starts to peak. You know, we may be even rethinking that, but there has been a lot of a lot of requests from providers across the board to help them define what's essential and non-essential, not only for the safety of the individual, but for the safety of their staff and also to avoid the risk of staff being un, unwitting um, vectors of transmission for this virus, right? So there are just so many components to that. Um, and I will tuck in under that uh, the need in both our non tradit you know, the, the provider community like home health and the designated agencies and Meals on Wheels delivers, deliveries, um, the, the need for personal protective equipment but not only to have it, but to understand how to use it, because it's not just having it. Um, and we are not the experts in that. And so really trying to work with the Department of Health to, to get out guidance about how to put it on, how to take it off, when you can reuse it, when you can't. That has also been guidance from CDC that has changed on a very regular basis. And so keeping up with that has been um, a body of work. And I, I don't, I don't believe that we're doing that as well as I would like, but we're continuing to do that. Um, then I think just thinking about that residential system and the capacity in that system, you know, we need to pay attention to the fact that it's dependent on staffing and the staffing is impacted by a positive diagnosis in a facility or even in a shared living provider. And then having to take that, that, um, idea of any staff that were connected to that person. And if they're at all symptomatic or ill, they, they are required to be out of work for a period of time to make sure that they're not positive. Um, this is all related to whether or not there's the capacity to do testing with somebody that's asymptomatic, which we don't have right now. We're certainly trying to test. And I think that there's an aggressive approach to testing capacity for people that are just demonstrating symptoms, but asymptomatic has not been a priority for testing. Um, and again, we're hearing every day different um, and updated information from the CDC about somebody who's asymptomatic who could in fact be positive. And so this is such a moving target. I feel like it's always hard for me to do this kind of testimony and this kind of an overview because I get overwhelmed even as I'm talking about it myself because the targets just keep shifting. So what you do, you can understand in one moment, but then as that shifts, everything changes and our providers are trying to keep up with that as well. Um, our guidance is trying to keep up with that, but they're trying to keep up with it. But the staffing impact, I think, is the thing that we're most worried about. Um, and then I just, I think I mentioned already, home delivered meals is such a critical service, much more critical now even than it was before. And it was always critical, but the need and the, requi and the requests have increased um, and the complications around delivery have increased, you know, exponentially and at the same time. And so trying to really support and address that with our area agencies on aging. Um, just going back to the idea that the conversations that we have with our long-term care providers, our residential providers, and with our developmental services providers to date have continued to emphasize the idea that our first goal is to try to keep people in place. We have to remember that when we're talking about long-term care facilities or shared living providers, we're not talking about somebody in a, in a bed that's transitory. We're talking about people's homes. So we're, we're operating with this idea that the first line here is to try to keep people in their homes and cared for in their homes um, while they might be sick. Right, and, and, and hoping that, that all of our clients fall into that 80% of people that are, gonna, that are gonna contract this virus and have only a mild case or mild symptoms where you wanna be when you're ill is at home. And so trying to really maintain that, we're, we're putting energy, most of our energy and focus into how do we do that? How can we support 
additional staffing if it's necessary? How do we maintain what facilities need, what providers need in terms of equipment and supplies to care for people in their own homes? The second piece of that certainly is trying to figure out what happens when that can't occur, when there is something that there's a level of staffing that's no longer safe or staff that can't provide that or, or um, a fear and anxiety response creates staff that, that can't and, and won't be able to continue doing what they're having to, what they need to do to keep people at home. And so that's the constant conversation. I know you've heard a lot about the state planning for a medical surge. We are also trying to plan for what we call tier two. I have no idea why it's called tier two. I think it's a kind of a CDC thing based on level of care, but recognizing that there will be people who need some level of support you know, kind of an ADL level of support. So think about our residential care providers across the state who might not be able to stay in place, stay at home, and might need some place to go to recover. Um, we're, we're trying to plan around that, but it is a really challenging conversation. You know, we don't have a site at this point in time. We're exploring different ideas, but staffing that is the challenge because the issue that drives people into this probably is gonna be staffing. So to imagine that there's another body of staffing somewhere is, is optimistic, um, but that is what we're planning for right now. I don't think that, that that level is going to suffice if our nursing home level of care starts to collapse. I think that that's a really different thing. But again, we've been working with nursing homes as has the Vermont Department of Health to, to keep people in place even when there are outbreaks occurring and we know that that's happening. Um, so um, one of the areas that we've been trying to really support and enhance is our long-term care residential and kind of reaching out to them. And so that includes nursing homes and residential care. It also includes the group homes through our designated agency and specialized service agency system. Um, and, and there have been uh, multiple calls. There was one last week, there's another one next week where we bring together our, our Division of Licensing and Protection and the VDH infection, uh, the EPI team, the, the infection and prevention team from v VDH to just answer, collect questions and answer them directly so that we're getting people information as quickly as possible. Have another call like that scheduled on Tuesday. Those calls are well over 100 people, 140, 150 people every time. And we are trying to keep them as ordered as possible, but also get information out as readily as we can. Um, so, Monica, this is Anne. As you're sure. going through this, um, what, and I'm just cognitive of the time, it's, you've been speaking for about 20 minutes. Um, we need to, I mean, you're doing incredible amounts of, of work, and we know that. Um, I'm wondering when you're going to get to both um, people with disabilities and what, um, just I'm wondering how, how you're doing in terms of what you're sharing. I'm trying to get a sense of time. So most of what I've been talking about is, is um, I guess I was talking about it at a high level and it, and it sort of captures both older Vermonters and Vermonters okay. with disabilities. If there are specific things that I'm not touching on, please, please, please yes. let me know. Um, well, okay. Um, it's a little nerve wracking to hear that you're preparing for, for tier two and you have no site and no staffing. So what are the, what are the immediate needs right now um, and how, um, is, is one of the questions. So I think, again, we have a team that's dedicated to that. I've pulled staff from across the department to focus on that exclusively. And they are certainly looking at different sites and trying to identify them. Um, and really also conscious of the fact that we have to be cautious about communities and, and, and talking to communities about um, about that before we take any massive steps. Um, and that's also something that we're doing as part of the work with the state uh, emergency operations center. So it's not happening, it's not just Dale trying to figure that out. That's happening under the rubric of the state emergency operations center because they have the resources to assist us to do that. Um, so that, you know, we, that just started on Friday, that particular body of work and what day are we on Thursday right now? So I, I think it is moving along really quickly. We started it, by reaching out 
uh, to every single residential care provider, nursing home, group home, to get a sense of what their needs are, because this is hard to plan if you don't really know what you're planning for. So assessing their staffing capacity right now on a good day, staffing capacity on a bad day, um, number of people in the facility, their capacity to isolate and treat somebody that might become ill, um, and then what their needs are for, for protective equipment. So we're that body of work has come together um, and we've gathered that information. We met this morning with Vermont Department of Health because they are deploying or redeploying their public health nurses to assist with the kind of response to residential facilities. So I feel like that work is moving forward. I didn't mean to be unnerving. I was just more giving you kind of a timing of, of where we're at okay. right now. That's, and I'm gonna have to stop you right now and we will come back. We have questions, but um, Max um, has to leave by 1245. Oh. And so I'd like to um, uh, hear from him as the uh, representative of um, individuals um, with disabilities. Yes. Max. Yes, thank you. So um, for those who don't uh, know me, um, I'm Max Barrows and uh, thank you so much for reaching out to me uh, to testify. And we want to thank each of you for working so hard uh, to do what is best for Vermont. And I hope you and your families are doing okay. Um, I work for Green Mountain Self Advocates. Uh, we are a disability rights organization with more than 600 members. I'm a person with autism and I receive developmental services. I receive services to help me with my job. So you, you want to know what, how my services are going. Um, my services have changed due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Instead of going to my office, I'm working from home. Uh, the support I get from an assistant uh, who works with me is done virtually through video on my computer. Having autism uh, plays a role in how I understand and cope with changes. Dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak has been an adjustment for me uh, in that regard. Uh, people with autism take things uh, literally. An example of that is that I had to clarify with people that the stay at home order does not mean you literally have to stay inside uh, your home, um, their home. I had to let folks know uh, that if they are not sick, that uh, they can still go outside for as long as they want to. Uh, they just need to make sure to stay six feet apart from others. Um, people with disabilities are worried about the, uh, that the police uh, would arrest them if they uh, went outside. And the reason for this is because in some parts of the country, law enforcement are being used as part of a restricting part of restricting people uh, from going places uh, and staying outside of their houses too long. During this time of uncertainty, Green Mountain Self Advocates, uh, we've been, uh, have been responding to uh, this by doing the following. We have created plain language documents on what is coronavirus, tips for working with support staff during the COVID-19 outbreak, and plain language glossary on words to know about the coronavirus. For 25 years, GMSA has been supporting 23 peer support groups across the state. On March 17th, we started having Zoom meetings three times a week geared for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. These meetings are a mix of presenting information and giving lots of time for people to check in. Also, people come with, up with topics they want to discuss for the next time. We have had up to 70 people on these video chats. And at night, our staff uses Facebook to video chat uh, with up to eight people at a time. In general, we want to thank the developmental service providers for all they are doing to support us. Most, of, most, most are doing all they can. The problem is 
the changes are drastic. And people with developmental disabilities are having a hard time understanding what is going on. Yesterday afternoon, uh, Dale put out guide, uh, guidance for agencies providing developmental services. To be honest, we are still trying to understand what it says. And here are our concerns. This does not seem to be the time for guidance. Dale needs to put out rules about how services will be provided and when. We do not agree with Dale allowing each agency coming up with their own plan. When self-advocates are on our Zoom meetings, we hear how things are different. For example, one agency is calling each person every day, whereas another agency has instructed some people to email their case manager if they need help. Number two, once there is a set of basic rules, there needs to be one primary communication strategy. Some agencies are sending letters, some are posting on their websites. Yes, it is a good idea to reach out in a variety of ways, but there should be one primary place to find the rules. Number three, the information from Dale needs to be in plain language. This is an ongoing issue we have been asking about for years. Here is what we are worried about. A, we are alarmed when uh, we read in the New York Times that Alabama and Washington State put in writing that people with in, uh, severe intellectual disabilities should not be given medical equipment like ventilators if supplies are limited. We understand that at times doctors have to, uh, to uh, uh, doctors have to uh, make decisions that many people, uh, you know, have to be treated, and not enough equipment uh, or personnel is uh, provided to help everyone. But we want the state to clarify, uh, uh, to clearly say. Uh, that decisions about who gets help should not be based on age or disability status. That is discrimination. B, uh, we are hearing that hospitals in some places are not allowing families to, uh, to be with sick loved ones. Please do what you can to allow people with intellectual disabilities to have family or a support person be with them when hospitalized. If someone is deaf, a hospital provides an interpreter. We may need someone to uh, with us to understand what is going on uh, with our health. This is an accommodation just like an interpreter is for someone who is deaf. One parent slash guardian told us if their adult child with a disability gets sick, they are not seeking medical treatment because they do not want the person to die alone. As far as we know, as far we know, um, the person with the, uh, with the disability was not told about this idea. C, at our board meeting on Monday, uh, four out of 17 self-advocates said they wish their agency was checking in with them more often. Again, we have heard that uh, many agencies are checking in on people every day. There needs to be an individual plan made with the person. It should include Dale's basic rules. It should be in writing. Some agencies have done this. It also needs to include what will happen if the person gets sick or somebody they live with gets sick. If it is in writing, uh, a person can get help reviewing it often so they truly know what is going on with their services. D, we are worried about people who get services who live alone. We ordered a thermometer for someone yesterday. They thought they had a fever and they couldn't check because they didn't own a thermometer. E, another issue is that um, agencies should, be, uh, should not be just relying on a person to call or text or email them. The agency needs to also initiate the contact on an agreed upon schedule. We need another person uh, do a three-way call with the doctor, with their doctor. 
We, when we asked them why we didn't email their case manager, the person said, quote, he is home with his kids and I don't want to bother him. To keep us safe, we need, we can't rely, we can't rely on a person with a disability to be the one to call. Letter F, the Department of Health is test of, uh, testing healthcare workers. They should also test home providers and staff. We should um, also be a top priority to get masks and gloves and other protective supplies. G, before the coronavirus outbreak, GMSA clearly said that a person with a disability should not be paying their parents to take care of them. But now during this crisis, if an agency does not send staff to help and a parent has to quit their job to take care of their son or daughter, then now under these circumstances, the state should reimburse the family for the money they are losing in wages because one of the parents had to quit their job. The money in their waiver should not should be used should be used to cover the lost wages. This is not an option after the coronavirus. Uh, this is not an option after uh, the coronavirus crisis. And H, we are worried about uh, losing staff. Turnover is already a problem. We understand uh, that you probably cannot do everything about an agency's personal poli personnel policies. However, we think that staff should be able to use sick time during this crisis. It seems unfair to us to uh, that that some agencies are not allowed uh, of not allowing staff to use sick time to make up for missed hours. Thank you again for asking me to testify um, during this time. Uh, the disability community needs the Vermont legislature to be proactive. The state of Vermont is doing a great job protecting our most vulnerable citizens. We ask that you continue to have our backs during this crisis. Thank you very much. Max, thank you very much. Um, and do you have that in writing? I do. Did, um, have you already sent that to us? Uh, not sure at the moment, but um, I have it and I will make sure it's sent. Okay, thank you very much, Max, I appreciate it. And we do right. have, um, we have a question um, from Teresa, Representative Wood. All right, go ahead. Um, thank, thank you, thank you, Max, for being here. Um, I, I just want to, um, I just wanna, I guess, maybe double check on a couple of things. So it's, it sounds like um, Green Mountain Self Advocates is continuing to provide a significant amount of peer support um, through its networks and, and using Zoom meetings and things like that. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, people um, at our meetings have been giving us uh, feedback about how things are going for them uh, during uh, this crisis. So everything that we are giving you is coming from the voices of people that come to our board meetings and also um, the communication we've been doing uh, throughout the state with our members through uh, meetings uh, via uh, Zoom. Um, so then th my follow-up to that is it, it sounds like that that has um, actually significantly picked up in terms of volume, you know, in terms of the amount of support that you are, um, that people are requesting, but also that, that Green Mountain Self Advocates is providing. And uh, I'm just wondering um, if it's possible for you to, to track any additional expenses that you might have um, as, as our uh, other agencies and providers. And uh, if you're able to track track those uh, at some point in time, uh, it would be um, helpful, I think, to make sure that uh, Dale has a copy of that um, as well uh, in terms of thinking about um, what the future lies and your ability to continue to provide that higher level of peer support to people. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. We'll look into that. Thank you. Are there other questions for um, Max? Max, thank you very much. Really appreciate um, the clarity of your uh, 
testimony as well as the outlining of the various help and support and perhaps changes in either uh, agency policy or hospital policy, those kinds of things. Um, so it'd be very helpful to have that uh, in writing um, as I was trying to write them all down, I might not have gotten them all in. So thank you very much, Max. All right. Thank you very much for the time. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Monica, I don't think you got a chance to finish. Sorry, I keep muting and unmuting. Um, I didn't, but I, I don't know if there are... Uh, the only piece that I didn't really cover in what I had prepared to talk about was just the financial work that we're trying to do right now. Um, so I can cover that and then move back through either questions or the rest of the witnesses. So um, I think we, we do have a question. And when you go, I mean, let me ask is the financial work that you're going through is you've asked all the agencies to, to create something um, and give feedback. No, there were, there's a, there was a, that was phase two for the designated and specialized service agencies. Phase one was to develop some strategies to stabilize them immediately, which okay. happened within um, a couple of days, really, of this all starting to unfold. So at this no. moment, oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry. This is, it's hard to manage. I know. Um, there, there are two, um, two people um, have questions. So hold that thought because the questions that people have may in fact be around something you've already said or whatever. And the first um, is uh, Representative Wood, Teresa, and the second is Representative Brumstead, Jessica. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, um, you talked about wanting or, or planning for in sort of the next phase of this of, of uh, standing up a recovery facility of some sort and, uh, and still looking at um, you know, where that might be and, and even how that uh, might be staffed. Um, Dr. Levine, um, you know, talks uh, every day about uh, the modeling that they are doing. I'm just wondering, have they provided any assistance to Dale in modeling how this might impact the particular population that um, Dale has overall responsibility for so that you have some idea about, uh, you know, maybe worst case scenario in terms of the numbers? Um, that you'd be looking at for such a facility. And then um, the, the second thing is, um, which I guess you alluded to, I was gonna ask you about um, the financial assistance that's being provided to the designated specialized service agencies and the other um, providers that um, Dale contracts with both in the near term and then looking at the long term, because as you I'm sure are aware, we're continuing to get um, emails from a variety of providers outlining, uh, you know, their significant additional costs that they are um, anticipating and incurring at this time. So, um, and if you were going to go through that, then just leave that for that. But if you wouldn't mind talking about the, the modeling. Yeah, so the modeling that's starting to happen now, or is, oh, I think actually there are probably going to be some conversations this week about it. The modeling is um, is across the entire state of Vermont um, in terms of what, what what the anticipation is for infection, and certainly more, even more specifically about the necessary um, components of hospital care that will have to be matched against the rate of infection. So kind of what, what do we imagine is gonna happen in terms of people testing positive? What do we imagine the needs are gonna be across um, hospital settings for personnel and equipment and beds in those arenas? I think it trickles down into some of the conversations that we're talking about in terms of our own planning. Um, but as I said, we're also working on that ourselves and we'll, and we'll have a better sense of what the need is across the residential care community and then are working directly with the DS directors to consider what's happening in their own communities, in their own, in their own agencies, what they're looking at in terms of stabilizing shared living providers and, and families and individuals by community. So the modeling that we're talking about is really more global across the state of Vermont. 
And remember that the biggest risk to, to everybody or the biggest risk of this virus is really very specific to our population. And so I look at that modeling and I think about it as, as ours um, almost collectively. So, so we would be able to get help with that for sure, but we're also doing some of our own work to try to pull that together and to think about it with both of those in, in mind. So, so do you have, let me be more specific, do you have a, an estimated number of individuals that you think may require an alternative living situation that, that will not be able to um, stay in place? I, do, I don't have that number today, but that's what we're trying to, to, okay. and, to consider. And, and, and when it, do you think you'll have that number? I don't know that I'm going to ever have that number absolutely because I think that that's going to shift and change day by day depending on what's happening in the community. It really depends on where you see uh, any kind of an outbreak and what the severity is of the needs. I think that the again the planning that we're really trying to focus on is how do we support providers to continue providing services? What will it take there. This, the idea of a surge is something far beyond and, and when, it, when that kind of provider system collapses. So the focus to date has been trying to stabilize the provider system as much as we can, because that's so really our, where best care our, is going to be delivered. Um, in the world of um, child care, in terms of um, supporting the provider, um, providers are getting um, money from the state whether or not there's someone there. Um, so how are, what kind of financial um, support are you giving the providers right now? So when we're talking about the designated agencies and the specialized service agencies, so developmental services specifically, what we did immediately um, or fairly quickly was to, to basically articulate that the same um, billing that they were accustomed to, to receiving, the same payment that they were receiving was just gonna stabilize through this time. So even though we know service delivery was gonna be changing, um, even though we knew that some services were not gonna be able to be delivered, we're stabilizing the providers by actually continuing their regular billing rates and continuing to push those out to them. So they should be experiencing some predictability and some level of relief because of that. That has stabilized. That's the phase one that I talked about. Phase two is a consideration of all of those additional expenses on top. So what are the costs that you're incurring because of this crisis that are on top of normal billing, um, normal expenses? And then that's, gonna, that's something that we're collecting now, that level. Um, and trying to figure out how we can support that. And that's happening between Dale and DMH because of course, most of our providers support both populations. So that's the phase two conversation that I was happening. But for, for right now, although I'm sure, you know, agencies are feeling um, under pressure, they should feel stabilized in terms of the developmental services side of the house. And in my conversations with them, that is what we're hearing is that that's been helpful and that that has enabled them to continue to think about how to be creative about service delivery, knowing that there is that stability in place. Another whole component of that that we are working on right now is, is there additional support that we can provide to families? Um, because there's a lot of families that are picking up the slack around this, especially as service providers can't come into their home or people can't leave home or shouldn't be leaving home. So that's a package that we're trying to pull together right now. Um, I can't talk really specifically about that because I'm still getting some um, fiscal approval around that, but we're trying to develop a package that will offer some direct supports to families um, and even to shared living providers. Some of those within the budgets that they have and some in addition to. So that's- So I'm not, um, I'm sorry, Monica, you're you're talking a bit, um, I, I, I'm needing some more crisp and perhaps some, um, maybe in regards to Max Max's uh, requests, one of which is to, when a provider, because providers, uh, um, the aides, what the case aides, the people who are working with people with um, developmental disabilities and others who are going into their home, who are um, being aides, who are no longer going because they're sick or they're um, for various reasons. So instead, the family member is needing to take care or needing, um, needing to um, 
be at home and do the care that they heretofore would not have been able to. Max said, okay, um, pay family members. That's not been something that the state has done before. If we wanted to do that, is that a legislative um, change or is that a, a rule change on your part? Well, it's, uh, it's something that we can do with an amendment to our waiver. Um, and we, we are exploring that in addition to some other um, ways of, of doing that without, without necessarily shifting all the way to paying parents because then that becomes a, 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 a tax issue. It, it becomes kind of a daily rate kind of an issue, which we are trying to address that need with the package that we're developing right now. I recognize that it's a need. I'm totally hearing that. And who are you developing the package with that is a legislator? Uh, no one. Okay, noted. Um, there is an appropriations committee and the human services, healthcare, health and welfare. Um, this is not a time for the administration to, 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 I mean, we need to keep our communication clear and together so that you don't come to us with something that we're totally surprised at. We've been working really well together. Let's continue to do that. Um, we've got two more questions. Um, Jessica. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And then, um, and then Mary Beth. Thank you, Commissioner Hutt, for being with us. I've seen you on the press conferences and I can only imagine how busy you are. I, um, my question is a question that Max posed when he um, testified about the guidance on consistency among agencies and consistency among commu um, on communication in particular seemed sort of something that is um, that we should be able to do. So I'm kind of curious um, what's happening with that. Right, so we certainly have, there's been a lot of guidance out to agencies um, in terms of how kind of best practice and also the precautions that they need to take. So I think that we have issued guidance about what we think is best practice in terms of staying connected, level of contact, um, and, and we can certainly, um, I didn't necessarily know that the conversation was going to be so specific to this, so my apologies for that. I can get more information from Selena, the DDSD director, about what's, what's happening there. But I will be honest and say we've issued guidance and best practice direction, but we've also asked our agencies to um, absorb that and to do what they can to follow that. So it, it's not rules at this moment in time. You know, every provider is under an enormous amount of pressure right now to maintain what they're doing. And I don't know um, that issuing a set of rules that then we would need to somehow figure out how to police is the best way to support this entire system to rally around and do what needs to be done. It, it does create a lot of um, quick decision making. It may create times when we're working on things and aren't including all of the right people that need to be included, there's a lot happening. Um, so I think I can certainly bring back, I wrote down everything that Max said, bring it back to our DS director, directors and to our executives to share with them back what the angst and the concerns are. And we can talk about if there's a way to make sure that there are standards that are in place in terms of contact. You know, we did just issue guidance I know that Selena did that talked about the level of contact that should happen with each individual. And I think that what agencies are also doing is really prioritizing people that are living on their own um, and that have fewer sort of family supports as well to make sure that we're not losing sight of that. Um, so I, I, I can certainly talk about that. Um, and if we feel collectively as a system like setting a rule is the right way to go, I think we can explore that, but I, to be really candid, I, I kind of hesitate to start there uh, because I think if we put people in a position where they can't follow a rule, you know, and is that, I think that what Max said that was really salient to me was this idea of an individual plan. I think that agencies need to understand what each individual person needs and to figure out how to do that. So daily contact with everybody isn't what everybody needs or wants. So I think what agencies are doing at this moment really is trying to go individual by individual, understand what they need, understand what their options are, what the supports are, and then to fill in those blanks as much as possible. 
So I think that that's really the, the better direction than here's a specific rule about a specific level of contact. Right. Um, and um, uh, Commissioner, what I also realize um, is that you are talking about private nonprofit agencies. You are not talking about state government. So they all, they, they're, it, it's, they, not only do we have individual need and the being individually responsive, but also the fact that these are separate organizations. That, that is certainly true across our entire provider community. We're not talking about anybody that we direct, um, but I, I, I just wanna say, I, I, I think that our provider system is doing a pretty extraordinary job right now. Okay. I just, just to add to that, I would just say that I, I know that they're separate outside of government and you're, you know, trying to, but I do think that everyone appreciates knowing what's going on around them. I'm not just talking about the disability folks. I'm talking about the um, agencies may not realize that, oh, this is working a lot better than this. And so this would be, maybe this is where we need to be, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, and as I said, I was on an hour long call that went far longer than what I could stay on for just this week with all of the DS directors exactly to do that best practice sharing. What are you doing? How is it working? How are you making that work? What, what should be different? I, I think that their desire to do what's right is, is incredible. Um, and and are, is there, are there gonna be slips? Absolutely, across state government and across the provider community. But I don't think anybody's coming at this other than with the intent to do the best that we possibly can while maintaining health and safety and security for everybody. Thank you. Um, Monica, we have um, one more question and then I apologize. We have a whole boatload of people um, so that we need to hear from. And um, so we'll probably circle back to you, if sure. not today, but later. Mary Beth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I really wanted to um, really underline the issue that Max brought up, and we've spoken about this, about um, families in my community who have kids with serious disabilities, like high disability levels, and are really in crisis mode. And, and I guess I, I, I really hear and I appreciate the value of trying to keep people in their provider locations, whether they're living at home or whatever. Um, but I don't, I don't understand, I guess, why we can't, we're in an emergency mode, we're in a state of emergency. And I don't understand why we are not flipping into kind of these temporary um, resolutions for people based on what they're asking for and their needs. I know we're trying to create systems, but I feel like we're in a place right now where that's really not practical. Um, so, you know, I, I, the issue about paying parents to take care of their kids when they can't work. I mean, my, I know that's not a best practice and not a road we want to go down, but I feel like right now that may be what people need in the, in the short term. So I just really want to encourage short term differentiated solutions that will keep people in their houses um, so that we don't have to go to this surge issue where people have to leave their homes. And I'm just hearing from, and you, you know the situations I'm talking about. I'm hearing from a lot of people who are in deep crisis and, and the DAs feel like, you know, they're, they're trying to be responsive and helpful, but they don't have the staff that can handle the level of disability that, that they're, you know, that they have. So that's that's kind of that's more of a comment. My que my other question, and, and definitely you know I know you're you're working hard. I can't even imagine being in your shoes, honestly. Um, the other issue is I'm just wondering. There's been this this concern raised about unemployment insurance potentially offering people more compensation than um, you know if they weren't on unemployment. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any of that relative to your staff pool, because I'm really concerned about that. We don't want to lose those essential people. It's a great question. I can't say that I have seen it across my staffing pool or across the 
pools for the providers. I think that you've got a couple of multiple representatives from provider groups here that can probably speak to it. I'm certainly a little bit worried about it when I think about um, frontline workers, direct line workers. I think about you know the, the direct service workers at the designated agencies. I think about our LNAs and the PCAs in nursing homes and residential care. Um, I think it does probably equal more than what they might be making if they were working. Um, and it was, uh, it's a well-intended policy that I think could have um, unexpected and unintended consequences. But again, I think for the most part, people are, um, are hanging in so far. That's what, that's what I've heard mostly and, and certainly are connecting with providers pretty frequently to, to check in about that. So That's Monica, great. thank you. You actually have one more question. Um, then committee, I'm going to say we have one, two, three, four, five people in one hour. So um, let's figure out how we're going to do this. But um, um, Monica, uh, Teresa has a question. Um, and I think if you're staying on the, f um, the call for, for the rest of the time, you will hear that um, people are very concerned about the last point that Mary Beth brought up and um, are hoping that as you are looking at phase two or three, that you are considering um, extra payments or things like that to these direct service workers who have not been making very much money to begin with. But so just ask you to put that in your box. Teresa. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, We've been talking about designated and specialized service agencies quite a bit in terms of, and appreciate the, the efforts that you've already taken to uh, stabilize the financial situations for that group of providers. There's a whole other group of providers, the area agencies on aging, the, the uh, adult day providers, the um, home health agencies, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing some, but um, are you doing similar things for, for those groups of providers um, and also thinking about, um, I'm just going to throw this in there, uh, you know, home providers right now, whether it's in the Choices for Care program or, or it's in the Developmental Services or TBI program for that matter, um, are, are now being faced with having people there 24-7 and um, whether or not there's any consideration being made to being uh, providing additional uh, financial compensation to those individuals, um, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, you know, any kind of um, uh, estimates being done about uh, what that might look like. Um, so um, there was one other thing that I wanted to, that I forgot. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for right this moment. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you, there were two questions in there. So uh, the provider community, the kind of the healthcare provider community, which is everybody that you just mentioned, basically, there is a process that's been created already through DIVA um, for people to apply for what they're calling like Medicaid retainer payments. Um, so that would include the area agencies on aging, it would include adult day, um, home health, residential care providers, to, to just articulate kind of what, was, what were their losses in, the, in a month, thinking about April, what are their additional expenses? And there's a very sort of down and dirty application through DIVA. And those are all gonna be sorted through at an agency level, which is incredibly helpful with representatives from each of the departments on those teams so that we can understand the scope of the need and, and push funding out um, to those agencies as quickly as we can. There, as I said, the other portion of this is really trying to analyze what's coming in through the congressional stimulus packages, through all of the CARES Act. There is a, a tremendous amount of um, information out there and trying to know what's available through those so that we're not duplicating and we can stretch the state dollar as much as, as, as possible, um, recognizing that even those revenues are being impacted by this. So there's this kind of terrible catch-22 circle that's happening. Um, in terms of home providers, the the proposal that I um, spoke to earlier um, does include a component of that for home providers. I know that the designated agencies are also putting that on their um, list of needs in terms of their phase two request. Um, okay. you know, there's a whole conversation with them about okay. all of those additional expenses. So we are really aware of it. I don't mean to make it sound like we're sitting around looking at proposals and outlining options. 
trust me, it's, it's happening really fast and it's happening, you know, 12 and 13 and 14 hours a day right now. So that's, that's, we're absolutely at the top of my list to consider that, Teresa, and to think about it. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. I just remembered the other thing. I just feel like we're talking to you and we're in a public forum and we know that there has been one um, death of a, um, uh, an individual who received services via Dale through uh, Champlain Community Services. Um, do we know of any other uh, individuals or are you tracking uh, other individuals, whether they are um, self-advocates, consumers, people receiving services and or staff or home providers that have tested positive? Um, as much as I get the information to me, I'm tracking it. I don't have a direct pipeline into diagnoses that are happening for individuals because that's still HIPAA protected. But as guardians are finding out about it, as agencies are finding out about it, those are filtering up to me. Um, it's happening less. Um, it still seems to be centered in residential care facilities, the positive diagnoses that I'm aware of, but I cannot tell you that I'm tracking that. Certainly agencies are tracking that really closely for their own populations and letting Dale know when that's occurring. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and Monica, you, you, you thought that you were um, <laughs> able to go off, but uh, Topper has a question for you. Representative McFawn, your hand is up. I think you're muted, Representative McFawn. I don't have oh. a question. Oh. I'm sorry, I, my hand was up. I put it down because somebody else asked my question. Oh, okay, great. Um, Monica, thank you very much. I sure. know that you and your staff are working 24 hours a day on this um, and we're just trying to wind our way through this and figure out what um, is the best way to do it. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, so um, I will Mary, stay on. I may close the video so I can grab some lunch, but I'll stay on and listen. Okay, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> that's important to take care of yourself. Yes. Um, Mary Moulton. Yes, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. If you could introduce yourself to the record. I will. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Mary Moulton, and I'm the Executive Director at Washington County Mental Health Center, um, where we serve people with mental health issues as well as developmental intellectual disabilities and autism and provide substance use treatment as well. So um, I'm here uh, to give you a bit of a picture and follow up to the um, comments that have already been made, let you know what it looks like like on the ground uh, from a designated agency standpoint and what we are doing right now and uh, how we are also interfacing with the state on this, which I'll get to toward the end. Um, may I ask the chair uh, 10 minutes? Is that, could you give me a ballpark so I can watch my clock? Um, I certainly will. And um, <clears throat> just um, committee and anyone who is listening, um, are watching us on YouTube um, on the uh, web page of the Dep of um, the House Human Services are your remarks and committee um, is your preference to have uh, the remarks up or um, on the screen for you to look at them or are you fine about listening without having them up? I'd rather listen. Listen. I think just listening is great. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, folks who, who want to pull it up um, on a second device, pull up the remarks. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, as we started this at the beginning of March, um, we realized that we needed to uh, set up an incident command system because of it. It's very overwhelming and. Um, we speak to the amount of hours that go into the day. The day just keeps going around 24 hours. So um, for us primarily, uh, what was most important is prevention and precaution information out to 
uh, all of our staff and our clients and consumers, as well as communication, communication, communication. So for that, that as I have conferred with my colleagues across the state is what other designated agencies and specialized service agencies have been doing. Uh, for Washington County, we have 30 sites. We have uh, six office buildings in that 30. The rest are residential care, group homes, uh, apartments, staff departments, um, shared housing with peers, crisis bed programs. Uh, we have 28 staff departments and we have 122 home providers. And you've been talking a lot about those this afternoon. So um, really wanting to communicate out uh, the precautionary measures on COVID-19. Um, and we have a great director of nursing who's just been leading for us um, communications once and twice a week, uh, and I communicate with my staff twice a week as well. Um, supplies were another very, very important factor, uh, making sure we had uh, personal protective equipment, making packets to get to all of our homes that I just mentioned, getting those to outreach workers who were still doing face-to-face uh, outreach and our emergency services teams. So um, we, as uh, Monica was indicating, you know, needed to make sure that indeed we have uh, personal protective equipment that um, we could estimate would last through this episode. And we are all struggling with that. But at Washington County, we, we had a good amount of masks. Uh, we added to that gowns, goggles, of course, we have gloves and we did a video that went out to all of our residential homes uh, around donning and doffing of that um, of those of that equipment so that we enhance our procedures around infection control. Uh, we have a daily call and that we do ask and have since the beginning of March who has symptoms within our staff and amongst our clients and consumers. What are what reports are we receiving? If they have symptoms, can we get our folks who are staff in for tests? And we've been very successful with that. Um, and then we uh, keep an ongoing um, recording of that so that we look every day and double back to see what the results are. And I'm happy to say that so far, we have had 20 tests and 20 negatives. We feel ourselves very, very fortunate at this point in time. Uh, we continue that daily report, and this is where our team comes together across the agency uh, for uh, 30 minutes in the morning for a very concise phone call on, um, on symptoms, on tests, on supplies, on communications, um, uh, and uh, other areas that of concern that are amongst our six different divisions between um, mental health and developmental services. So. Um, having got that off the ground, we then knew we had to reduce our footprint within our buildings, and we've done that with the exception of our residential care facilities, where, of course, we have to have direct service staff, but we've even worked to do that a bit by taking out program directors that don't have to be there face-to-face, -face. and we moved to telemedicine everywhere we could so that we maintained communication. Um, I, I have been a disaster responder for a long time, and um, I was moved by what Max said about family members not being able to communicate because when you go into isolation in the hospital, that's it. Um, you don't have that, and I think it's a place where we could look to see how we get devices um, into isolation uh, within um, institutions to try to have some of that communication. It's been successful in other disaster settings and we haven't moved to that yet, but we have gotten um, devices as many as we can out into the community for our consumers and uh, clients and we need more. That is a definite need. So we are tracking our supplies and equipment um, lists as we've had to increase deep cleaning, as we've had to try to get more communication devices out. We've moved from at Washington County, we didn't do a lot of telemedicine. We're really, you know, the touchy feely agency. So, uh, you know, we do everything face to face, but um, we have changed and in one week's time, uh, moved from like 10 
probably 10 hours a week of telemedicine with psychiatry to 60,000 minutes. And I think last week, uh, this week, we're at 144,000 minutes of tele um, with um, over a thousand uh, contacts. So we're, we're doing the best we can to move that quickly. And we have been um, with our uh, consumers in home provider situations that have had to go home, um, really been identifying individual needs uh, as representative would, or one person was saying, you have to do that. It might not be every day, but there are people that need everyday contact and we're doing that. We're actually tracking that so that um, we are, um, as we move a workforce home and out of our office space so that we have accountability. Um, just as I'm watching my clock here, so as we moved through that quickly, what we what we realized uh, as program closures happened, uh, the programs we've had closed were two congregate uh, type programs, um, day programs, and a school, and that was big. And so our entire educational workforce, our our BIs, um, that shifted, and we we have been asked by the departments to hold on to our workforce as much as we can. So. Um, while they did phase one and we'll keep all your money in place, we did do some layoffs um, because we have people whose health is compromised uh, and they can't work. They shouldn't be in the workforce at all. So we have, a, uh, we have a small number of layoffs, but other than that, we've maintained our workforce and we went into redeployment mode. Um, we set up a redeployment center. We did a survey with all of our staff. We had uh, 450 respondents to our survey as to whether they would shift jobs, work in a residential within their division, whether it be children's, DS, or mental health, whether they would work uh, across divisions, whether they would deliver groceries, whether they would make meals, um, would they work emergency services, which we also have succeeded in um, doing uh, remotely in uh, cases with the emergency room now. And uh, we still are going out with police in certain settings, but otherwise we're working on remote with emergency. So um, we got very, we had a very successful survey. We now have a, um, we have had 45 people redeploy to different jobs this week. And we've done a little statistical modeling uh, based on how the uh, virus might advance. And our statistician who is really good at this stuff, just looked at the general population and the progression and how that might advance amongst our uh, staff and our um, clients and consumers, particularly in residential. And we are estimating that we need 20 to 25% more staff within our residential facilities uh, than we currently have. And as people become ill potentially and move in and out, we are, are trying to redeploy in line with that. Um, uh, we are looking to a couple of sites and actually have established two areas where we would do our own sites to support people should the home provider become ill and can't take care of their, uh, of, of their um, uh, family member, family member person that is under their care. Um, and so we, we are trying, to, we have identified staff that would staff that site that are currently working in a residential home and we'd be familiar with the, um, with the procedures around PPE, very familiar. Although we're also, once we identify someone to work at a site, trying very hard not to move them, trying to keep them with that site because we don't want staff moving around, if that makes sense. Uh, so CDC guidance, um, we, we read it every day. It changes a little bit on us every day. As Monica has said, this is a moving target. Um, we have been working closely with uh, Department of Mental Health and, um, and Dale on uh, the stabilization of our funding stream so we don't have to hit target numbers. As you know, with payment reform, we have a lot of target targets to hit. So those have been relaxed. Um, how it, and we receive our, our uh, bundled payments. The, the one concern we had was uh, we, you know, within our agency, um, as many of you know, are able to stay up above due to uh, behavioral interventionist contracts with schools. And so we're now working on a case rate there. And on phase two, we identified um, what it would cost for us to go time and a half within our residential facilities. 
um, which is uh, a, not a small number. Um, we have a lot of residential facilities throughout the state and also providing $1,000 per month extra to home providers. Um, and we're submitting those numbers to DMH and Dale for consideration. And uh, we know that you know, our, our response as we chat with, with the commissioners about it is that um, they have to develop a methodology as these requests come in from different parts of the healthcare system in order to respond. And uh, we have got, had great communication. Our, of course, our one concern, of course, our one very big concern is um, how do we receive reassurance and how quickly could we receive that um, given these numbers to move to that. We have, we have and we know that there are um, sites being set up around the state. I saw an ad put out just yesterday by, the, um, by OEO, uh, $40 an hour to start to come in and staff that center. And so we are doing it in residential facilities um, throughout the state and we've got to move now to move our folks up because of the um, unemployment rate offer, because um, people will become ill, because this is a very hard thing to ask folks to do and we need to be paying them for doing it. So maybe I'll wind up there and take a breath and allow people to ask questions, Madam Chair. <laughs> And I know Julie Tesler is also here. I don't know if she had anything that she might add to that whirlwind. Are you muted? Um, I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you, Mary. Um, and I, I thought it was important for Mary to present to the committee because she's at the ground level. Uh, Vermont Care Partners, I was working very closely with each and every agency um, so to ensure that we have a systems response. And, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, I apologize. Sorry. I was muted, and so you didn't hear me. There were three questions for um, the previous speaker. So sorry. Okay. I'll wait. I love your background, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. Um, committee, we've got Mary Beth, um, uh, Topper, and Carl. So Mary Beth, go first. I presume it was for... Um, the previous speaker. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mary, I'm curious uh, relative to that unemployment situation, the question I asked previously, are you, is your staff hanging in there? Are you seeing um, folks staying healthy? Um, and I appreciate your point about us moving fast to um, come up with those supports. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the, we have a great culture and um, yes, we are maintaining our staff from the moment we started. Our message was we want to be sure you have a job at the end of this. So we messaged that and we messaged that. Um, we do have some folks who are just asking uh, to go home and it's a small handful over uh, under a dozen and we had some folks go and actually when the when the governor was saying, you know, um, sign up for unemployment with your, you know, he was just giving, it was in a context, but all they heard was sign up for unemployment. We were suddenly having people sign up who were working. We're like, no, no, <laughs> not how it works. So um, we're hanging in there and um, our message is strong that we want to redeploy you. We do not want to uh, have you um, uh, access unemployment if we have a job for you. And uh, however, if you're in the category of being a primary caregiver or you're in a category of having a compromised health condition, that is different. And um, you have a choice. And we have often offered voluntary layoff solely. So um, we want people to understand that we're there for them should they choose unemployment, we will call them back on April 30th and see how things are going. Uh, other than that, they could take vacation time, or if it's in an undetermined period of time where we're talking to them, we've continued to pay them under what we call our own COVID-19 admin leave, and we figure it out. We also have developed a sick bank where um, some of our staff have donated their vacation time into, uh, into sick time, and we have been um, using that bank, which is very healthily stocked at this point in time. Does that answer your question? 
Yes, thank you very much and for the work you're doing. Thank you. Okay, Topper then Carl. Hi, Mary. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question about people that might be food deprived. Mm -hmm. I, I know when I read your piece, you talked about uh, a place in Stowe and another in your own kitchen. Um, how is that working? Uh, are you able to keep up? We, we are. We actually have uh, staff who are um, access the food shelf. And um, we have a very good network with our clients and are delivering food, delivering groceries, even delivering meals. And within our region, we have a regional command that was set up and um, we have people cooking um, to make meals and deliver them to uh, folks who are homeless um, and may be food deprived in hotels. And that number, I didn't, I didn't get on the report today, but it's, it's been, um, it's been several hundred meals a day in some cases. Um, one thing I will, uh, in our region, we had our shelter moved to the Econo Lodge, 38 rooms filled um, individually. And so that's a place that we, uh, that not Washington County, but our region has been providing food through, through Capstone. And it's been a great uh, group of providers coming together um, to do that work. So, so far so good there. Um, we do know we have a lot of people that have come from other areas and are in hotels in our region and um, that's becoming uh, a challenge, but um, they're notifying that they're there and accessing food as far as I know. Yeah, is the galley involved at all? That I do not know. I think, I believe they are. Because they, they, they were making 400 meals a day and said they could do more. Yeah, I believe they are the group that's doing the meals because 400 is the number that I heard. Okay, all right. I, I'm Carl. Not, okay. Sorry, did you have another question, Tom? Well, I, I talked to the director there yesterday and um, they, they, they aren't involved the way they can be, he said. So just keep that in mind, Mary, it might be. Okay, place. good to know, thank you. Carl. Thank you, uh, just to follow up to what Mary was talking about, we had our designated agency monthly meeting yesterday afternoon, both the executive committee and our regular meeting, and we're brought up to date on issues similar to what Mary's talking about and her agency. In our case, we had 130 people that most of them voluntarily, but that went on temporary furlough. Uh, we're continuing to pay their health insurance, uh, but they're going to be receiving unemployment the way we understand it. And it's certainly going to be our pool of people to be able to bring back as we need to, to backfill people, especially in residential care environments when when or if they uh, they are become symptomatic uh, and need to be removed from from what they're doing in in those uh, residential care facilities. So at the moment, it seems to be transitioning reasonably well. But just like you said, every day is a, a new day. And in our case, we had that number of people available primarily because we have a lot of people in the school system. We we have. Uh, uh, doing support in in area schools, and of course, with all the schools out, uh, that's not a requirement right now, uh, at least uh, for the most part. And in addition, we run a special school down in the Bay, the SOAR, as it's called, yes. for uh, difficult students, and uh, and that's totally closed. Down. So we have this group of people available. So we're hoping uh, to work out as, as best as it can. And, uh, We'll recall those people as we need them. So thank you for bringing people up to date. We're, we're actually now gonna have a, every two weeks an update of where the agency is, um, you know, what's the status uh, of the, of the <clears throat> agency uh, on a bi-weekly basis. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you Carl. Um, and I have that Teresa Wood has a, a question and I'm presuming that Mary Beth Topper and Carl will be putting their hands down unless they have another question. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, so uh, Representative Rosenquist is bringing up a question that I meant to ask um, Commissioner Hutt, but I'm gonna ask it through Mary now. So when you're, <laughs> when you're receiving the stabilization, uh, you know, essentially saying that you're gonna to continue to get the resources that you would have gotten, um, you know, had you been at full service capacity, both on the DS side and on the mental health side. Um, did that come with the expectation that you continue to um, pay your staff and have them employed? Because it, it would concern me that, um, for instance, NCSS is furloughing staff if they're receiving payment to keep them on. Um, you know, to me, that's that's a concern. So was that part of the condition of, um, of receiving those payments? You know, it was not from uh, the Department of Mental Health. Monica um, had said that uh, in conversation. I wasn't present for that. And we had already made a few layoffs, um, voluntary layoffs uh, due to conditions where people actually could not be in the workforce and couldn't work remotely. So, um, but there's nothing, unless I missed it, nothing in writing to that effect. Um, it was encouraged and I think we, uh, all embrace that with the spirit of it. But um, uh, from what Representative Rosenquist was just saying, we moved quickly before these conversations happened. So I think that in his region, there had been action on that prior to um, hearing, hearing that there was a desire for us to hold on to our workforce. Um, and so uh, nothing in writing that I know of. Um, okay. I don't believe agencies have laid off uh, many folks, and um, I don't know what that looks like out there. But, um, that, uh, thank you. That was um, that was my impression as well from the folks that I had heard from. So I was just surprised to hear Representative Rosenquist talk about that. That's quite a large number of layoffs at, at one time. If if money is continuing to flow, um, I think that's. I'll talk with Carl about that offline. Thank you. <laughs> Um, could, I, could I add one thing, Madam Chair? When, could I? Absol absolutely. Um, just in, in talking to other agencies, I just would want to um, say that, you know, as we put our numbers out there and we move forward with what we believe we need to pay extra, uh, and the departments are working really hard with us on this, we know that um, there are agencies that might have a really hard time waiting and we're not sure of the timeline. So I did, I did ask the commissioners this morning. Um, if there would be some kind of emergency relief or ability to call for assistance. And I know that um, uh, just that, that they will look into that. And so at this point, um, we have put that uh, question on the table just out of concern for some, particularly some of our smaller SSAs. Um, we believe at Washington County, we can hold on um, because expenses won't hit our books until mid April and um, we, we've spoken with our bank already if we need to go out on a line of credit, uh, but we you certainly would like to uh, encourage and I'm sure they'll work with us on a, on a timeline so that we can understand better what that will look like and there are so many uncertainties. So Thank you. I, I, I would leave you, Thank and I know there may be more questions, but please Thank take you, care Mary. of yourselves. Thank you, um, Mary. <laughs> Thank Take you. care of yourself. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Julie. Okay, I'll be just really fast. Um, you I don't just, have to be, well, people will come back or whatever. Okay. I, I want to say that um, the teamwork and the, the, the way the agencies are working together has been incredible at every level, from program directors to the executive directors, the human resource directors, the CFOs, every, they're, they're meeting constantly and sharing best practices problem solving together. And that's also happening with other health providers. Um, and Jill Olson, who is gonna be speaking later has been the organizer of that. And that's been amazing effort to keep health and human services moving forward. Um, going to the finances, it's true that the on, there are ongoing payments, but there's new expenses right now, which includes the, the PPE, the personal protective equipment. Agencies are trying to get tablets and equipment to folks so they can communicate and use telehealth. Um, we're now feeding people we didn't think about feeding before and enhanced pay and payments to the shared living providers. Some agencies are going ahead and making those payments because there's a lot of fear that 
we could lose some shared living providers. We're asking them to do 24 seven services when they, that wasn't what they signed up for, for the most part. Um, so there's a lot of, of movement going on and agencies are tracking the expenses so that we'll be able to figure this out over time. State government's been really supportive and helping us work it through and we're getting information to them all the time. Um, I was I was surprised to hear Max say that some folks are not being monitored, that it, it's being left to the people to initiate that. That's not our understanding. So if 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 you know, I'll I'll follow up with that. Um, we have our case managers, our nurses going, you know, checking with folks and and through telehealth. Um, but that's pretty much ongoing. It's particularly for people with developmental disabilities. We're also using this time to do a lot of cross training so that we can back each other up. Um, and for the staff who aren't actively working in a school, they can be cross trained now to do residential work as Mary was saying. Um, we're also learning how to do online activities, online groups, psychotherapy, all that work is going on for all populations, including people with developmental disabilities. Um, the loss of routine, the loss of day activities really does affect people, particularly with developmental disabilities and autism, and folks on the autism spectrum. So, um, you know, some people are now not able to communicate because they don't have that, uh, the day staff there to help them do that. Um, some, some are concerned about loss of routine. So folks are, are feeling the stress. Um, we're seeing it in behaviors. Um, and it's, it's going to continue to be a concern, but we're doing everything we can to address that. So that's just kind of the, the broader picture. Um, but I, I think as a system of care, it's been pretty remarkable. Um, and I think for the most part, we're meeting people's needs. Julie, thank you. And I, <clears throat> it is really clear that, that the players have really worked together to try to um, react as quickly as possible and to put things into place. And I hear that uh, the community mental health centers and the specialized service agencies, they're needing money. Um, are there any policy changes um, specific to uh, this pandemic um, that, 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 that you um, and would, would identify? I think we've been in constant communication with state government about that and also through our national association. So relaxing a lot of the Medicaid rules so we can do things by telehealth um, and using phone only. Go, go, so, going forward, not what we've going done. Going forward, going next forward. steps. The phone only is the hardest thing right now uh, for people who have only Medicare coverage or that's their primary coverage that we can't use it for anything except for evaluations and check-ins. So you can do a psychotherapy session. So that affects the elder mental health care right. that we do and the outreach. Um, I think the other thing is just the documentation and outcomes and what those requirements are going to be. And that hasn't been all worked out. So, okay. so, so in terms of um, um, policy um, expectations that are in the Vermont state law related to um, the agencies that you serve, that you, that you coordinate, or the organization does and the people they serve, you do not need any policy changes. You just need money. I'm, I'm just- Yeah, that we- I, And I'm not downplaying that. I'm just trying just, to be clear. Everything has been communicated and is, is in the works. Um, so there's nothing to add to that list that we haven't already communicated. And I, I think we've gotten good support from the legislature. So I think we're in a good place with that now. Okay. I can't say there won't be something in the future, but for now, okay. I think we're in a good place. Thank you. Are there questions for Julie? Okay, um, Laura, thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Laura Pelosi. I'm here, good afternoon. Representative. Good afternoon. Thank you, Laura Pelosi representing the Vermont Healthcare Association, which is our long-term care facilities, the nursing homes, residential care, and assisted living providers. Um, I'm gonna to cut to the chase with uh, how Julie ended, which was uh, thank you for passing H742, which was the legislation that has really given us what we need to the extent you know anybody can manage this kind of a pandemic. 
but in terms of the regulatory and um, licensing flexibility that we really needed. So we greatly appreciate the house's efforts in that regard. Uh, and I'll go back to something Commissioner Hutt said, which, which is this is a very fluid situation and a moving target as we learn every day about this virus. Um, the facilities are receiving information and guidance daily from the CDC, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Vermont Department of Health, Dale. Um, it's really an amazing amount of information as the research changes on a daily basis, as best practice and standards change on a daily basis. And it covers you know, everything that our long-term care facilities are doing to try and combat this virus. With respect to um, what we're doing regularly to work with the state on planning for surge, you keep hearing about planning for surge. Nursing homes in particular play a pretty unique role relative to the hospitals and trying to make sure that we can take care of patients that don't require hospitalization, but are acute enough to, requ to require um, medical care. And so on a daily basis, we are providing to the state uh, bed availability data, as well as our um, personal protection equipment inventories. With respect to our challenges, um, they are really threefold. The first being workforce. Um, before we uh, left the state house in mid-March, um, I had spent every day visiting as many committees as I could to talk about our severe shortage um, based upon the work that we did in the Rural Health Task Force over the summer and fall. And what that work told us was that we need today 5,000 personal care attendants, LNAs, LPNs, RNs. So we entered this pandemic with a severe shortage of nurses. Um, which has led over the last few years to a great increase in the use of our traveling nurses. So workforce is a top problem and challenge area because as, as workers become exposed to the virus and have to go out um, on leave, it presents us with a significant challenge. We need more staffing to take care of folks during this crisis, not less, as um, I'm sure is pretty obvious. Um, one of the things that we are currently evaluating um, to get back to some questions that were asked earlier is the impact of the unemployment insurance um, program that is recently passed and evaluating what the impact is going to be on some of our uh, lower paid workers. So we are talking with the administration with respect to how to better support those individuals and their jobs because they're critical and essential to our ability to do this work. The second area, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about this, is the national shortage of PPE. That's your masks, your gloves, your gowns, your N95 respirators. Um, the Vermont Department of Health has prioritized long-term care facilities to receive PPE. Um, you know, they have to request it from the state inventory. Uh, the Department of Health has been a fantastic partner all around in this. I have to say they're working hand in hand with the facilities every day, um, they don't have enough access to PPE. So I'll give you an example. You, know, you can have a facility that will request a thousand masks, um, but they're only able to receive a hundred masks. So the Department of Health is doing a great job of trying to get it out to long-term care facilities. The VTrans trucks were tra traveling around the state last week delivering PPE to our facilities, but it is still not enough. I had a great call a couple of days ago um, from a community member who's working to um, sew masks for long-term care facilities. So the association is organizing a mask drive and the CDC, while they're not um, really permitted as sort of a first course um, in an extreme shortage and, and with lack of anything else, um, we can use those. So that was, that was great. Um, and then financial stress. Obviously, uh, there's going to be financial stress on all of our facilities as they have to expend resources um, to combat this virus. Um, we are certainly working with DIVA in the short term around some emergency funding for ERC and ACCS providers. Uh, that went out on Friday. Um, there's a process by which providers can let DIVA know what their needs are. Um, with respect to nursing facilities, we're still waiting on some guidance on what that process is going to look like. It sounds like they're going to do a modification of our existing extraordinary financial relief process, but these are emergency funds. Um, they're not, um, 
you know, we've heard about stabilization funds, but these are emergency funds in the short term. So we're working through that uh, process now. Um, and, you know, working, I, I have to say the uh, coalition of providers that Julie referenced and that Jill, uh, we, we tasked Jill Olson with uh, getting us all organized um, has been great because we're able to share resources that are coming from our national associations. Um, we realize that we all share common problems. So we're tackling them together. And that's been, I think, a great um, outcome of this. So I'll stop for any questions that you might have because I know you're short on time. Well, Representative Pew, I think you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mary, Beth, <laughs> Mary Beth, you have a question. I do. Thanks, Laura. Um, a question. Um, I've seen a you know this whole mask issue, um, and I I know that the health department. I mean, I'm guessing. I don't know this from them verbatim, but I'm guessing they don't want to really push the the PPE um, requirement because they want it to be available for their most kind of frontline people, their doctors and nurses first. Um, but I, I really feel like these are effective and more and more we're seeing that people should be wearing them most likely. I'm curious in the long-term care facilities and nursing homes, are, is everyone wearing something at this point? So we are following CDC and Department of Health guidelines. And because of the national shortage, CDC has conservation measures that are in place. So facility, and for example, if you're gonna get um, PPE from the state inventory, you have to agree to comply with the conservation measures. And so those measures are different depending on the type of PPE, whether it's a mask, whether it's gowns, whether it's N95 respirators. And those conservation measures really say, this is when you use it, this is when you don't need to use it. This is how you can reuse it. This is how many times you could reuse it. So it's, um, you know, these are guidelines that, that you know, providers are working with every day. Um, if we weren't in a shortage situation, things would be different probably. Right. Yeah, so because- what if, what, if, what if someone wants to wear one, but there isn't enough and they're, you know, the health department is saying, oh, you know, what if they make one? Can they wear it in a facility? Well, and that's what's so great about this mask drive that's going on. It's a group of folks in Waterbury, Representative Wood, uh, who have started this up and got in touch with me this week um, to, to make handmade masks. And so, yes, they can be used as a last resort under okay. guidelines. Thank you. Are there other questions for Laura? Um, Laura, I guess I have a question. Is there anything that you um, believe should be done differently um, in terms of protecting Vermonters who are in nursing homes since, um, and, or, and other long-term care facilities, since I believe we're up to about six now. Um, yeah, we have two nursing homes and one residential care home. And then um, I, at least that's my, current recollection and the remainder are in senior living communities, which are not the healthcare facilities, but 55 and up apartment complexes. You know, this is so challenging and no one's ever seen this before. And I think that our Department of Health and the CDC are, you know, reacting as quickly as they can um, and have been extremely communicative, as has our National Association, who has been really, I think, ahead of the curve and looking at what's happening in other states and issuing best practice guidelines. So I think, you know, we have had the benefit of that. Having said that, what we're learning about the virus and the fact that asymptomatic people um, are really shedding virus makes this particularly challenging in a long-term care facility setting. So, you know, I wish this weren't happening <laughs> for sure. But I can't think of anything um, from a policy perspective that we we could be doing differently. You know, I'm sure we'll look back on this, you know, a couple of years from now and say, well, now we know X and we should have done Y. But we'll 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 do that afterwards. But I'm I sure hear what you're saying. Sure. But Thank I think you. we're doing the best we can. Thank you. 
Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate it, Laura. Um, Jill Olson. If you lose my picture, um, uh, we have horrible internet here, three and a half miles from our state capital in Middlesex. <laughs> um, I have to say, I don't have a lot to add to what you've already heard. Um, the challenges, particularly Laura's testimony, I think are very similar in home health. Um, as a reminder, we have a medical role and a long-term care role. So we're, we're working both very hard. Um, and certainly in the long-term care um, realm, we're really concerned about uh, retaining our staff, particularly with that unemployment insurance provision that uh, you heard about earlier. Um, on the medical side, our focus this week, uh, I just had a board call with my members not not more than a couple hours ago, uh, you know, long conversation about PPE, all of the questions that, that you've been asking, um, but also uh, really a focus on what we're doing to help hospitals uh, not be so full. So we have COVID positive patients at home. Uh, the, the federal government just uh, made some changes to oxygen um, supplies that, and, and where they can be um, utilized. And so we're going to be able to take care of more people at home with oxygen who are COVID positive. So I think our role is going to increase um, uh, pretty quickly. Um, we are, um, we're doing things like uh, blood draws and injections and infusions that would normally be done in the hospital. We're doing them at home to take the pressure off the hospital. And then um, as hospice providers, um, what some of my agencies are doing is they're taking that hospice expertise and they're using it to create bereavement programs really just focused on COVID-19 for staff, for patients, uh, for families. And so uh, we're really trying to sort of take all of the tools in our toolbox um, and, uh, and use them to, to help our state at this time. Um, I can tell you that we are definitely seeing the downturn in uh, revenues that many organizations have seen. We're not doing much physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, because it's, you know, it's, they're not really necessarily essential. Uh, sometimes they are, but often they're not. So um, we have been really appreciative that Diva has figured out uh, the sort of, I call it the lifeline process. So if you're really about to go under, you can't make payroll, there's a process in place. We haven't seen the same kind of stabilization um, program yet. I think that's something I'm hopeful is in the future. Um, but because we don't have the kind of fixed revenue contracts that DAs have, uh, there wasn't as obvious a way to, to, to provide that support to us. Um, so, uh, but we're working in a very close partnership with the health department, with Dale, with our other um, association partners, which has just been such a, an incredible source of support and, uh, and effort, and then with our national partners too. We need a lot of help from Medicare to meet this crisis, and a lot of our focus has actually been on, in that realm. I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, we, but you have questions. Um, oh, committee, okay. And, and committee, as you have questions, we have eight minutes and we have someone for, um, else to testify. Uh, so Teresa and Jessica. Teresa. Thank you. Um, mine is quick and you just touched upon it a little bit, Jill. Uh, what, because home health agencies rely a lot on Medicare, what are you seeing in terms of any kind of flexibility from Medicare with regard to payments for home health agencies? Yeah, we had some good news and some bad news this week. Uh, on the good news side, um, they have relaxed the homebound criteria so that all of those COVID positive patients who might not otherwise meet Medicare criteria for home health now will. So being COVID positive and needing our services counts as homebound. Being quarantined counts as homebound. So that's good. Those are people we can now care for and get paid to care for uh, without any other changes. What's bad is that we have all these services that uh, we're not providing in person, some of which actually can be provided uh, over the phone, but we cannot be, and we're allowed to do it, but not for money. So they're not paying us to do those things over the phone. And that's uh, really a pretty significant disappointment that we saw in the most recent guidance. We continue to push for that um, at the federal level. 
Uh, they also actually made a, a, a helpful change where they suspended the um, sequestration cut that was made during the Obama administration. It's a 2% Medicare cut. So they've restored that temporarily. So that's just extra cash flow uh, coming to us for everything we can bill for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jessica. I um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Jill. I just um, wondered, I'm so happy to hear that we're going to be able to bring oxygen into people's homes and not, I just wondered, because I've gotten some concerns from constituents who just are afraid to go to the hospital right now, and mm -hmm. um, wondered what that step would be, not to mention that our rescue squads are, it takes two hours to clean them after bringing someone who's COVID positive to the hospital and they only have yep. one. So, um, but I'm curious about what was the holdup? Was it Medicare that was saying no? Yeah, yeah, it was Medicare. Okay. So it's a Medicare waiver that we got. It's all about the money. So it's a Medicare waiver and I think a regulatory thing too. I literally got the notice this morning at nine o'clock. So I, I have not dug into it. And when I told my members that it had come through, they all demanded that I give them the information immediately. So um, I'll have more to report, you know, another time. But um, but I do know that the flexibility has been granted. Um, I, I have to say, actually, you know, Medicare has been pretty good about granting flexibility in many areas. Um, there are a few notable exceptions, but um, they have been really trying to make this work better. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Kristen. Thank you, Kristen Madam Lovely. Chair. Yes, uh, you all can hear me, I assume. Yes. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, for the record, I'm Kirsten Murphy. I'm the Executive Director for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, and for the second time this week, I'm just going to say out loud that I have this very awkward situation of both wanting to express incredible support and gratitude to the state and to the agencies and our colleagues. And at the same time, we have a role under federal law of checking in with individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. And then, you know, if there are concerns, it's our job to, to bring them um, bring them up. So I, I mean no disrespect or, or criticism. I know people are working really hard. Um, during week one, um, we as a staff made a point of calling all of our council, public council members, many of our leadership graduates, and talking, we've talked every day with Green Mountain Self Advocates. Um, oh, and um, we um, then developed a set of, of 10 recommendations. Many of them Max has articulated. So, um, and submitted them to the Developmental Services uh, Division and to Commissioner Hutt. We are um, disappointed that we've not heard any response. Um, but- um, when, did you, when did you submit them? Um, I would have to look at the date on the letter, but about 10 days ago, I believe. Okay. And we understand how busy everyone is, but they do seem like pretty common sense um, concerns. But I'm gonna highlight three of them and I'm trying to talk as fast as I can. So um, one, I have a significant concern about setting clear expectation for home providers about reporting when someone in the home is sick. That is in guidance that was issued yesterday from Dale. That is, so they have articulated that expectation. But I, it's buried, uh, you know, on page five. And I think um, I, the, it is not inconsistent to have both minimum clear expectations that are rules or a matter of contract. Um, and at the same time, at acknowledging that our system has a great deal of individualized planning to take place. Um, the, I won't go into it at length, but the incentives for home providers are aligned in a way that might not everyone would respond this way, but might cause um, a home provider to be reluctant to report if a household member has um, is exhibiting system, uh, symptoms. And yet it is urgently urgent that they talk not just to the health department like you're supposed to, but to their agency so the agency can make an assessment about whether quarantine at home is appropriate, whether somebody needs to be removed from that house, um, and I, I bring this up also because my understanding of the, the one death that has occurred through the, the Choices for Care system did involve a home provider situation with, I don't know who got sick first, but with a home provider and an individual who both had symptoms. So I, I feel like this is a protection that's pretty important. 
Um, the second recommendation that I want to speak to Mary Beth um, Redman, Representative Redman did um, allude to, and that is the situation that we're hearing from families who have a child or a teen with significant disabilities. Vermont made a reasonable decision many years ago that kids and teens would mostly be served through education. So they have therapies and school nursing, along with special other special education, more traditional instructional services. Along comes COVID-19 and, and a prolonged shutdown that we could never have anticipated. But families that are used to having a very large chunk of five days a week, knowing that their children are receiving the services they need, um, are now those children are now home. And the, to make it more complicated, often there are issues around the parent's health or the child's health that mean that they cannot allow help to come into the home. So the only, only reasonable way to address the high needs of um, some of these children are for the parents to be providing it. And that may, of course, have financial impacts and cause the families to need to, um, to quit or um, suspend paid work. So we strongly recommend some type of financial relief for families in that situation. Um, I wanted to say two things about that. The optics here are really important. So notice that I've said, I've avoided saying paying parents. I am saying financial relief for high uh, needs families. Um, now, as a practical matter, the state may need to waive temporarily the prohibition on paying parents. Um, but it's my understanding that designated agencies, I believe this was said today, are, are maybe receiving some additional payments because the workload has increased. And I, I think parity needs to kick in here for the families that are also doing that. Um, second, I just wanna say clearly, again, the word temporary is important. The council doesn't typically support this kind of approach, um, but we're not having a philosophical conversation about paying parents right now. We have an emergency situation. This needs to happen. It needs to happen very quickly. These families have already had these kids home for three weeks. And I'm hearing stories of, you know, behaviorally challenging situations that um, involve maybe aggression and, um, you know, real um, possible harm uh, to people, as well as, uh, you know, tremendous concern on the part of families for medically mm -hmm. fragile children um, who are already somewhat underserved. So I think that can't happen fast enough. I'm pleased that uh, Commissioner Hutt is pursuing some kind of family package. I hope that she will reach out to families and or their advocates and allies as they craft that, um, that package. Um, the other issue that I wanna bring up, another recommendation that we've had is um, the need to look at the critical workforce that is independently employed um, uh, through um, home providers or families themselves. And this is the workforce that supports, that provides respite, or also the workforce that's families who self and family manage their services. Um, that workforce doesn't have the same flexibility that those who work for agencies have. So there's not, a, there's not an entity that can redeploy those folks when some of them may have to be laid off because of, again, this, this concern about introducing the virus into the house, especially as we know how sneaky this virus can be. So I have a member, for example, who is trying to work from home. He and his wife have significant health challenges. So they, they have had to um, not have the seven person team that supports their son come into the house. But they have spent two years building that team. And um, the, a lot has gone into that. And it is his wish that he be able to continue to employ that team so they're there in a few weeks when he's going to need them again. Um, so I hope that people can look at that issue. I know in earlier versions of um, H742, there was some conversation and language around being able to pay for services when the services are not actually taking place specifically because of COVID-19. And my listening to those that committee conversation, um, I, I believe the language was pulled out, but the reason it was pulled out is because um, that can happen under existing authority and the committee didn't want to put things in a bill that were redundant. So this, the intent of, of the, I think it was Senate Health and Welfare, certainly, 
was to again look at can we retain this, this uh, you know all of our work all of our important workforce and i just want to flag that the independent workforce build through ARES. and with that i will recognize the time and i'm a little over and thank you madam chair oh no thank you kristen it really is um important to hear all of what's working and we do acknowledge and appreciate your beginning that conversation your testimony with that conversation, but also to point out um, what what is needed, what is needed to pr um, protect Vermonters with disabilities, with underlying health conditions and um, other things. Uh, are there questions? Um, Jessica, I see your hand up. Is that from the last or do you have a question for uh, Kristen? No, that was old, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, Kristen, thank you very much. Um, thank and, you. And committee, it is um, two o'clock. Um, we have, um, we're going to work on scheduling kinds of things, but we do have a committee meeting tomorrow um, where we're not having anyone testify, but where we're going to have a committee discussion about where we're going forward, who do we need to hear from, et cetera. Um, and that is Friday. And we're um, also going to be having some technical uh, training as well. Um, so thank you all very much. And James, again, happy belated birthday. And we will see you all uh, on Zoom tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.